Welcome back to the second video on our conversation with Dr. Dennis Koh. Where do you see fintechs in Singapore or in, in the ASEAN region? Have they become more matured? Where, where do you see the growth of fintech in this market? Well, first, uh, as I explained in the book, right, um, I think banks have always worked with and used B2B fintechs because there are very few banks in the world and probably none now uh, with, the, with you know, the advent of the global financial crisis, banks have really concentrated on scale where they're big. And you know, there's a diseconomy of scale in banking because it, as you get to more countries and you're, you don't have scale, you have more regulation, right? It's actually your operating efficiency goes down. So banks have really scaled back. Uh, and with that, right, you really want to focus on your core business and not you know, write software. So I'm not a big believer that banks are software companies with licenses. I, I don't think that makes any sense. What that means is that there's no opportunity to partner uh, with B2B fintechs. And I think uh, if you look at core banking is a great example, right? Uh, there's a lot of core banking uh, B2B software providers. What has changed is simply they are given a new name now. They're called fintech, right? Uh, secondly, I think the, the other major change is that uh, it's software as a service. Right? So you don't have to buy your infrastructure, you don't have to buy the software, you can basically rent it as a service. So I think the, the, there's very strong promise uh, for fintechs. Uh, you know, when we were building tomorrow, we monitored closely uh, fintechs of interest, uh, especially fintechs that were in the uh, domain of digital engagement and how they use data to engage customers. And we monitored that group of fintechs very closely because access uh, to the fintechs that are going to have the capabilities and technologies that are going to succeed is critical to improving your roadmap in terms of how you can use data more proactively. Um, of course, there are fintechs in the B2C space. Now that is more controversial because uh, if you, know, you believe my thesis that the only thing left is experience, right? Because everything else, uh, you know, has gone on the wayside. Then why would you want to share experience with somebody else? Right? It has to be you have no choice, right? Like regulation in some countries separates uh, the wealth business from the retail business. And because of that, partnering uh, becomes critical uh, to serving the entire spectrum. Uh, the other reason uh, may be inefficiencies. And you see many examples of fintechs in payments where there's friction, there's high costs, right? Uh, but outside of the obvious pain points and outside of regulation, I think that it will be very difficult for the B2C fintech simply because if experience is the only thing left, then you, know, you are going to protect their experience. You are going to want to be prime in that experience so that you can ensure that your customers uh, are, are enjoying you know, the very best treatment, the very best experience you can possibly generate. So the B2C fintechs that don't find a problem that is big enough to solve, like in the transfer of funds, right, uh, globally, right, where I think uh, anyone in banking knows the issues, right? You don't know when the funds will arrive. There's a lot of documentation. There's a lot of uh, codes that you use that are very, you know, uh, uh, undecipherable. Uh, if you find a niche like that, then I think uh, there is a possibility of building a very successful B2C fintech. But outside of that, and outside of regulation, I think uh, the B2C fintechs have a hard time because the banks want to own and drive the experience going forward. So AMTD also got an ecosystem known as SpiderNet, which has got both financial and non-financial players. And in your book, you talk about horizontal integration and vertical integration. If you do decide to go into this platform play, what are the critical factors that you need to consider when you actually partner with other players? So uh, in the book, I kind of contrast uh, my experience in uh, information technology. And you know, when I was a young engineer uh, in HP, actually this was unfolding you know, right before my eyes. In, in, in a 10 year period, right, um, computing went from vertically integrated where IBM, Deck, uh, and companies like that made everything from the chip all the way to the sales and servicing. Yeah. Uh, and then comes along the IBM PC. And the IBM PC really uh, unlocked 
uh, what would become a horizontally, in the, uh, horizontally structured uh, industry in computing. And in that 10 year span, uh, many companies you know, fell by the wayside. And this uh, was possible because the IBM PC set a new standard in the way different components could be uh, structured together, integrated together to form the PC. Mm -hmm. And you can see some signs of banking heading in that direction. Uh, and you can also, I think, easily understand that certain organizations with certain DNA are bad at certain things, right? So banks, as we discussed in part one, if they're really risk managers, they're probably better at ensuring the, uh, you know, pro the, 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 the whole integrity of deposits, risks, etc. Yeah. But, you know, these might not necessarily be the best DNA to create the best user interface, to focus on the, you know, thousands of details in creating the best experience. Somebody else, you know, a fintech company that is smaller, uh, more focused on the new methods of design thinking, of bringing, you know, the, uh, to bear the detail and process might be better at doing it. So you can see some aspects of this coming to play. But I think one of the biggest differences that I see that I articulate in my book is that uh, the standards that developed around the IBM PC were very extensive and very complete. But in banking, um, you're going to have more difficulty because number one, uh, a lot of regulations are local, right? Because as we discussed in part one, the importance of the industry. And because it's uh, local, uh, there are much more difficulty uh, in the way of creating global standards, right? So it's not only about open banking. There's a lot of focus on open banking, and I think open banking will do a lot to allow in the near future a core banking system that could be swappable, right? And, and that on itself is a you know, major development forward. But in order for it to be really horizontally uh, uh, structured, right, to serve customers well, you need standards in KYC, you need standards in operational risk, you need standards in credit risk management. And those are, we're going to find in the financial service industry are going to be harder to come by. And therefore, uh, there may not be the sufficient uh, support uh, from a standards perspective to usher in a change in a 10 year time frame. But if these uh, accelerate, because of the work of standard bodies or because of the work of interested parties, then yes, there is a much higher probability that uh, there will be horizontally uh, specialized companies that can provide the interface, that can provide the uh, credit uh, capabilities. But in the financial services industry, of course, the banks still have the ultimate uh, decision-making authority in terms of credit, in terms of capital. And there are other, other factors that play in becoming a successful digital player in the market, like regulations or lack of regulations. What are the other factors that, for, for example, if Singapore has to become a smart nation and create a lot of these digital fintechs, what do you think, what else do you think needs to be true? Well, actually, uh, my, I think my answer is going to surprise you and maybe surprise the audience, right? I think from my uh, writing the book and from my research, the biggest gap in the market is really there is a lot more solution looking for a problem than there are meaningful problems to solve. So there is a tendency in the technology, and you know, I came from a technology background, right? And in technology background is very common that you're idea oriented, right? You start with an idea. And of course, an idea is an innovation, right? Uh, in, in the book, it talks about having to pass three very difficult hurdles of desirability, viability, and feasibility. And so, the technology industry is very used to the method where you come with an idea, you create a solution, and you look for a problem. In fact, there's a term called, where's the killer app, right, in technology. Now, when you apply that to an ordinary business, it doesn't work because uh, ordinary businesses are not in the business of pivoting uh, technology to, f to solve a problem. They need to understand their fundamental customer issues and where they can you know, uh, create value. And if they create the wrong thing, they have to write it off. And you know, smaller, bigger companies, yes, they can 
have the muscle, you know, financial power to write off and do something else. Uh, but of course, even they get tired, you know, of doing uh, mm -hmm. one success, one, one failure after another. Uh, but for smaller companies, you really don't have that luxury because you're going to spend that much, much amount of money and you'll be written off then, you know, who's going to have faith that, you know, this thing can be uh, replicated, right? That you can be successful. So I think in the end, the biggest issue I see right now is, you know, the focus on the customer, the focus on the insights that are described uh, in the book and how can you really understand the problem in detail and the problem that is uh, meaningful and worthwhile to solve. I think that uh, is the bottleneck that the industry faces today. Interesting. What next for you in your literary career? Are you planning to write more books? Are you already working on something else? Uh, well, uh, as uh, I indicated, I think at the, at the end of the book, uh, I'm actually working on a step-by-step -step guide uh, that kind of takes chapter 5 uh, and converts it into a company playbook that helps companies uh, increase their chances of success in their digital transformation for by non providing... Non -banks. For non-banks. Yes, for non-banks. Because uh, when I uh, wrote the book, I generalized my learnings uh, into chapter 5, which uh, is the uh, origins of the methodology, which I call the All Digital Future uh, Playbook. And it generalizes that uh, outside of financial services. In fact, uh, aptly, uh, Chapter 6 is uh, titled Beyond Banking. Thank you so much. If, if people want to know more, then I, I would strongly recommend that you buy this book and there's a lot more insight. Thank you so much for the conversation and all the best. Thank you, uh, PK. It was uh, very enjoyable and uh, thank you so much for having me on the program. Thank you and thank you. Hope to see you in the next video.